When I say the words American aviation, what comes to mind? Perhaps you picture the Queen of the Skies, that American icon that helped to define the jet age. Or perhaps you think of America's big three, who've become synonymous with flying in the States. Or maybe, just maybe, you think of American airports. More specifically, just how much they suck. While many airports in Europe, Asia, and the Middle East feature vibrant, high-tech terminals catered to the customer experience, American airports are defined by long security lines, overcrowding, and a general sense of poor upkeep. But why is this? Why does the richest country on Earth have some of the world's worst airports? Let me explain. Before getting into it, I should mention that I made this video in partnership with Nonstop Dan. If you guys don't know Dan, he's one of the best flight reviewers on YouTube, and he's done a great job adapting his channel to the world of COVID. While this video tackles why US airports suck, his companion video takes a closer look at why US airlines suck, which I'll link down in the video description. Now, a major complaint that's levied against US airports happens long before you ever step foot in a terminal. Getting to them can be a massive headache. Many US airports are not only located well outside of city centers, but they are only accessible via car. The worst offender might be LAX, which not only lacks a rail connection to the greater Los Angeles area, but is also located in a city that's notorious for its traffic. Now, the lack of adequate public transport connecting American cities to their airports is largely due to America's obsession with building roads. Over the past 60 years, the US federal government has spent much more time and effort building out highways than railways. But even in those American cities that do have extensive metro systems, travel times to airports remain prohibitively long, with a few exceptions. Consider this. New York's subway system is the largest in the world, with over 400 stations and 229 miles of track. And yet, a 2015 study by the Global Gateway Alliance ranked JFK as the world's least accessible airport. It takes anywhere from 70 to 90 minutes to make the mere 14 mile journey between Grand Central Station and JFK, requiring transfer between at least three different trains. The hard truth is that American airports are reluctant to make themselves more accessible to mass transit. And that's because it would directly eat away from one of their critical revenue streams. While most of an airport's cash flow is driven through aviation-related activities, such as landing and slot fees, their largest source of non-aviation revenue comes from parking. In 2016, US airports collected $5.8 billion in revenue from parking alone, which is nearly four times as much as they made from concessions. This is also one of the reasons why so many US airports have made it much more difficult to access rideshare services like Uber and Lyft. Now with all of that parking money, you might imagine that American airports would have plenty of resources to stay modern and well-equipped. But let's not forget that airports are incredibly complex and thus very expensive. Before those parking funds can be spent elsewhere, they must first be directed towards maintaining runways, taxiways, and other infrastructure that's critical for operational safety. Once these expenses are taken care of, little if any money is left over for other improvements. As a result, American airports have long been panned for being dirty, overcrowded, and poorly maintained, with President Joe Biden once saying this about New York's LaGuardia Airport. If I took you in blindfold and you took to the LaGuardia Airport in New York, you must think I must be in some third world country. But I know what you're thinking. Kobe, all airports, whether in the US or abroad, have to prioritize spending in this way. So why do American airports in particular tend to fall into disarray? Well, it's largely due to who owns the airports. As a brief aside, let's take a look at Europe's top airports according to Skytrax. Of the top 10, nine are either entirely or partially owned by private investors. In fact, 50% of Europe's airports have some degree of privatization, which has a major impact on the airport experience. 
You see, private enterprises are highly profit motivated. Their primary objective is to maximize shareholder return. As such, privately owned airports are incentivized to build a customer experience that extracts greater revenue from passengers. This starts at security and check-in. According to a 2019 study, passenger spending decreases 30% for every 10 minutes spent in security lines. So private airports dedicate more time and effort into streamlining security and check-in. Once you're through security, you'll find that many European airports don't announce your departure gate until right before boarding. This forces travelers to spend more time in the airport's social spaces, where they're more likely to spend money. And not only do these social spaces feature shops and restaurants, but sometimes include fitness centers, libraries, spas, and even casinos. Such amenities not only drive more revenue, but also improve passenger well-being. This encourages European travelers to fly rather than choose the real competitive threat that is high-speed rail. Now, you might expect for American airports to also be privately owned. After all, America is the land of unabashed capitalism, and the government deregulated the airline industry back in the 70s. But that's actually not true. Nearly every American airport is managed by either federal, state, or local governments. In other words, they're publicly owned and operated and are not profit motivated. As a result, they're highly reliant on government grants to improve, and these grants are often awarded with strings attached. For instance, in the years following 9-11, many US airports continued to receive government funds but they were mandated to spend that money on beefing up security and couldn't spend it elsewhere. The good news is that American lawmakers are starting to wise up. And in recent years, many private airport partnerships have been greenlit. For instance, JFK launched a $13 billion renovation effort in 2018, aimed at building two new terminals and improving airport access. And of those $13 billion, $12 billion comes from private investors. While this is certainly a step in the right direction, there remains a silver lining. These private-public partnerships are only really viable at the country's largest airports. Many smaller airports simply don't see enough passenger volume to drive meaningful profits, meaning private investors are likely to shy away. This is actually a key reason why so many US airports are publicly owned in the first place. Most would go belly up without government backing cutting off local economies from the rest of the country, and stunting regional economic growth. While this is mostly the case at small, regional airports, many more medium-sized airports are falling into this trap as well. Let's take a look at Memphis International Airport as an example. It's located in a city of 650,000 people, meaning it's a critical travel hub for the region. However, it's unlikely to see much by way of private investment as it continues to age. You see, Memphis's airport has lost all private appeal thanks to America's spate of airline mergers that happened in the 2010s. Prior to 2008, Memphis was a hub for Northwest Airlines, serving as a connection point for Northwest flights all over the country. But Northwest fell into financial hardship during the Great Recession, which ultimately led to their sale to Delta. Delta didn't need Memphis as a hub, so they scaled back their operations there. And an airport that drew 6 million travelers in 2010 was seeing just 4.5 million a decade later, a 25% decline in passenger volume. A similar trend has occurred in Cleveland, Milwaukee, and Pittsburgh, cities that once served as hubs for major airlines that have since been acquired by others. So as American aviation evolves in the 2020s, we're going to see a dichotomy emerge. The country's marquee airports will get substantially better, which is going to be great for millions of flyers, but the rest will continue to rely on government funds to stay afloat and are likely to continue falling into disrepair. Unfortunately, that means that the majority of American airports will continue to suck for the foreseeable future. Folks, if you haven't done so yet, go ahead and check out Dan's companion video and make sure that you tell him that I sent you. Oh, and if you're coming from Dan's channel to mine and you're new around here, go ahead and say hi in the comments. I'll say hi back, I promise.
Thank you so much to my patrons for helping to make this video possible. If you want to join the Patreon community and help this channel to grow, go ahead and check out this link right here. And as always, if you learned something new today, leave a like and subscribe to keep learning. And until I see you again, don't forget to look up.